District 2 Budget Town Hall. My name is Vincent Molden, and I'm the Director of Community Engagement and Constituent Services for County Executive Pittman's Office. I will be moderating tonight's uh, town hall. This town hall is part of our annual uh, Budget Town Hall series, and this is your opportunity to let the county leaders know what you think about, uh, what you think should be funded in the county's FY24 budget. This evening, we will hear brief opening remarks from County Executive Stuart Pittman and Councilwoman Allison Pickert. Then the County Executive and the Budget Officer, Chris Trumbauer, will share a brief presentation about the outlook for our FY24 budget. After the presentation, we will open the floor for public testimony and you will have a chance to share your thoughts. That's the fun part of tonight. Before we begin, I'd like to take a chance, to, uh, an opportunity to introduce our elected officials here tonight. Uh, Allison Pickard is here. And I will give a shout out to her legislative aide as well, Kristen Etzel. Kristen, can you wave your hand? I'd also like to thank the county staff who are joining us here tonight. Um, we have uh, Kim Clooney from DPW. Thanks, Kim. And Carissa Kelly from the Department of Aging and Disabilities. All right, and now without further ado, I'd like to introduce County Executive Stuart Pittman. I'm not gonna say much yet, I'll say a bit in a few minutes, but um, thank you for coming, really. It's, uh, I think we're all a little bit spoiled by Zoom, and uh, we're doing these after two years of doing them online. We initially did them in person. Uh, people are, uh, maybe they just don't want to get out. So we have a smaller group. I know we'll ha we have people watching online, but um, I'm sure they'll figure out a way to tell us what we need in the budget. But I see the animal care and control people are here, as always, in their shirts. <laughs> and... Uh, I'm sure we have some, some, uh, some regulars that we like to hear from, but these are important. We started them four years ago. We do one in every council district, as, as you know, I think, and we have actually funded things that we for, heard about for the first time at these budget town halls. Uh, some of them are parks. Some of them have to do with animal care and control, um, and uh, they, we really do listen to these, and it's also a wonderful opportunity to listen to our shared constituents with the council person from each district. And Allison Pickard has been an amazing partner for us for the last four years. We've done, I believe, four very good budgets that we're proud of. This will be number five, and uh, our job is to make sure that we spend the taxpayers' money as, uh, I mean, not everybody agrees, but uh, as most people want, want us to. And so we're gonna do that responsibly, um, as we always have and try to deliver and invest in this county um, uh, because it's a great place, the best place for all. So I will introduce uh, Councilwoman Pickard to you and she'll do an opening statement. Well, good evening everyone. And really I wanna say thank you for being here. It's a cold and rainy night out there, but this is important dialogue that we're gonna have, and this is the beginning of a conversation. As you learn a little bit about the financial outlook for the county uh, for this year's budget, um, I hope you spend some time thinking about uh, the needs that you see in the community and uh, keep the dialogue open as we go through this. Uh, the county executive will um, present a budget in May, and the council, as the final fiscal authority, will work through May and June and strike the budget by June 15th. Um, we have a lot of competing needs in the community, um, but we are also in somewhat of a strong fiscal uh, position, and I'll let Mr. Trumbauer talk about what's on the horizon, but these are uncertain economic times as well. There's nothing's been, uh, nothing's been status quo for the last few years. So I really do wanna say thank you and um, keep, keep engaging uh, even after tonight. And if you're watching at home and couldn't get here and something uh, sparks your interest, there are more budget town halls that are happening in person as this is the first one. So um, you can always attend uh, a future one and you can look that calendar up. So thank you again. Well, good evening, everyone. I am Chris Trumbauer. I'm your friendly neighborhood budget officer. 
And uh, today I'm going to go through a few slides. Uh, the county executive has asked that we give you a little bit of a fiscal update this year um, to kind of show you what he will be considering as he works over the next couple months with his team to put together uh, the upcoming budget. So if you can go ahead, Jenny, to the, okay, here we go. This is a little message from Stuart. You guys can read that. It's all, it will also be on the Anne Arundel County Your Budget page, um, but it just gives us a little bit of an introduction. If you go to our next slide, um, this is the timeline for budget, and as you can see, we spend the better part of a year working on the budget, um, but the important thing is right now we're in that yellow oval that says you are here because this is the most important time. This is when we're getting the information and we're starting to put together uh, all of the departmental requests and the community requests, so there's still time to influence what happens. And that was very important to the county executive that we have these early so that when he goes to make decisions and formulate the budget, he has the community input as, as part of that. So if we go to our next slide, um, this is where the revenue the county gets comes from. And you can see the top two things there, property taxes and local income tax. That's about 70% of all of our, of our revenue. So that's really the lion's share of what the county gets to fund all of the good programs and initiatives that uh, county residents depend on. Um, as you can see, it's about $2.1 billion in the current year budget. We're in fiscal year 23. And you can see uh, there's little green or red arrows next to whether that revenue source has increased or decreased from last year. And we're pleased that most of those have increased uh, from last year, which represents a pretty healthy and stable local economy. If we go to the next slide, we see the other side of the house, which is where does the money go. The biggest bar on the top there is our school system. So almost half of the county budget in our operating funds goes to our friends at the school system. And then you can see the other categories there, public safety and human services, all the way down to uh, like our library and our judicial systems proportionally. Okay, so the next slide is just a little bit more detail. Because uh, our Board of Education is almost half the budget, it's important to realize what those components are. It is about 47% of this current year budget. Um, so direct funding, that's money that we give straight to the Board of Ed is $835 million. And then there's a couple other things that the county contributes to the Board of Ed. One, we pay for their debt service. That finances all the capital projects like new schools and things. And then our school health program, our school safety program, and you add all that together and that's where you get the 942 million. So just want to have one slide about the fiscal responsibility measures in our current year budget. And I know the county executive is proud of these. Um, but last year in a what I would call a consensus budget, it was a bipartisan budget that we got six of the seven uh, council members uh, to vote for. We had an income tax rate, 4% tax cut for every taxpayer on the first $50,000 of your income. So if you pay taxes in Anne Arundel County, you got a tax cut last year. Uh, we also set the property tax uh, rate farther below the level that we're allowed to set it than ever before in county history. Re that represented a savings for county taxpayers of about $25 million. And then we maxed out our rainy day fund, which is kind of the county savings account. We're all the way up at $132 million. And that's the funds that the county will use if we do experience an economic downturn, which many economists are predicting. And then finally, we had something called a structural deficit, which is when you're spending um, one-time funds on expenses that happen every year. It's generally not what we want to do, but uh, we did have a small structural deficit during the pandemic years. Last year, we were able to finally eliminate that completely. So next slide. This is a great slide. This shows the yellow bar there is Anne Arundel County, and this shows every different county in Maryland what their uh, tax rate is for property tax. And as you can see, we're one of the smallest bars there. So we have the eighth lowest um, in, in Maryland. And if you look around, um, most of our what I would call peer counties, which are other central Maryland large counties, are very much higher than us. So we're getting a good deal in Anne Arundel County. And the next slide shows you just the history of that tax rate. Right now, we're still at a very, I would say, relatively low tax rate compared to what the county has uh, seen over the last 30 years. Um, so that's something I think all county residents can be proud of. Uh, next slide goes to the other side of the income, the income tax. 
Uh, what we're looking at here is an even better deal for county taxpayers. We are the fifth lowest um, jurisdiction. So we're paying um, most, most income is about 2.81%. As I mentioned before, we did a cut on the first $50,000 of income, so that's at 27 But see all those bars on the left of the screen that are all the way up at the top? Those are the counties that have the max tax rate, and most of those counties are other large counties. We're one of the few that has not reached that rate, and we're very proud of that low tax rate. Next slide just shows the history of our rainy day fund. That's kind of the, the reserve fund I talked about before. Um, the blue line is um, what the current uh, balance is, and the orange line shows what the maximum allowable uh, balance can be. So we're right at the top. Next slide, I just wanted to talk about a couple good things that are in the fiscal year 23 budget, specifically here for District 2. And I won't go through all of these, but you can see there's a wide variety of, of projects uh, from transportation to utility projects to education. Our friends in Rec and Parks are very busy these days in District 2. And then uh, even a public safety project there with our fire equipment maintenance facility. And I can assure you that Councilwoman Pickard keeps us on our toes, making sure that we give District 2 its fair share of attention during the capital budget process. Um, okay, now I want to talk about what we see heading, looking ahead. So fiscal year 2024, which is the year that will start in July in the budget that we're formulating now, um, we're looking at uh, revenues. And right now, the, the income tax and property tax revenue for the current year is still coming in strong. That's good. The other component of taxes that we rely on are real estate taxes, which we call recordation and transfer tax. Those are falling because interest rates are really high, right? People aren't buying houses and refinancing the, like they used to. So that's resulting in a reduction of tax revenue to the county. And it's okay, because we knew this would happen and we planned for it, but it is something that we have to watch for. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to briefly talk about is what we call our fund balance. And this is um, extra revenue that we get because the, the revenue came in more than we budgeted for, or we realized savings in our operating budget, which we work hard to do as well. Um, so I want to show you one slide that, that really drives home what we're talking about, the real estate taxes. Um, if you see on the left of the screen, you see that kind of shark fin, that little mountain that goes up and down. That was the housing bubble in the Great Recession. Well, a couple years ago, we started to see that line go up again, and we think that's great because that's county revenue, but we knew it wasn't sustainable. We knew it would come back down. Um, so last year, we're gonna th we think that the total amount of recordation and transfer tax is going to come in at $198 million. That's by far the most it's ever been. There's no way that we're going to get that this year or the year after that. And so we're going to expect it to go to a more manageable level. The good news is we budgeted for that, so the county will be um, in good hands, I think. Next slide is um, just our expenditure side. So when we look to put together the budget, there's some things we have to do that we need to fund. Those are we call non-discretionary increases. So this is like our debt service increase. We have to contribute to our self-insurance fund. We have to pay our employee health care and pension costs and retiree health care and things like that. Then we have uh, what's classified as discretionary um, uh, increases. And these are things like what pay package are we going to give to our employees? What incremental funding are we going to give to the library? system, the community college, and then, of course, the big one, which is our Board of Ed. Um, the school system uh, is a large school system. It takes a lot of funding, and they're very good at asking for more things every year. Um, so the next slide, this is something new that we're doing this year, uh, which I think the county exec is excited about because we're giving you a window into what his decision-making process needs to be. So on this chart, which I realize is a little bit small, um, but you can see it uh, at home if you want when you log on to your budget and you can see um, this presentation. But you can see that those um, discretionary and non-discretionary uh, sources are itemized, and then we've got estimated expenses there. Now, this is for the current year budget, and this generally represents where we were towards the end of the budget season last year when we were trying to put everything together. So think about this as being around April. And we had about $130 million of what we call incremental recurring revenue. And this is just more money than the previous year that we can deploy into all of those things that we mentioned in the previous slides, okay? So you see all those things I listed, and then you see dollar amounts. The non-discretionary subtotal is about $21 million. And then all of those discretionary things, that totaled out to about $109 million. And you can see included in that was the $50 million of incremental funding for our friends at the Board of Ed. So that's $130 million, and that's how we were able to deploy it. That's what got introduced as our fiscal year 23 budget, okay? Now go to the next slide and you'll see what we're dealing with this year. 
So it's early still, but the budget office is preliminarily estimating that we'll have about $80 million of incremental recurring uh, revenue. Now compare that to last year when we had 130, um, 130 minus 80 is 50 million, right? That's 50 million less. Now why is it less? Mostly because that recordation and transfer tax is falling off so dramatically because people aren't buying and selling houses. And we were in a little bit of a uh, hot real estate market there. Now that's okay again because we plan for it, but what it means is that we have less money to give to a lot of those discretionary costs. So our very ballpark back of the en envelope uh, estimates at this time are the non-discretionary uh, category. It's probably going to come in somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 million. That only gives us about $50 million to program into all those important things. Library, community college, employee pay package. Um, our departments request extra funding for programs and initiatives that they want to do. Um, so we have all those things that we need to fund with about $50 uh, million less money this year if all assumptions hold. So that's what the county executive is reacting to right now as he begins the process of working with his team to formulate a budget. That's what the county council will be deliberating on when they get the budget on May 1st. Um, and have the charge to pass it uh, by June 15th. So that's a quick look at what's going on. I'm going to hand it back over to Stuart, and uh, he can talk a little bit about where we go from here. Really fast. That was good. Did you all follow all of that? I hope uh, that was um, really good because it's complicated. <laughs> no, fast and good. Um, and that's why we have Chris here. Um, he can actually talk to regular people about budget, and he can talk to budget people about budget. Um, so, I mean, this is, wait, that last slide, just, just one more time, because this really is what we're confronting. And we didn't do this in the previous years. We didn't, I've, I've got it. Um, and the budget office was a little bit reluctant to, to put out projections that they know are going to change, because then as soon as they change, of course, everybody's going to scream and yell. Hopefully they change for the better, but... Um, it's, it's uh, if you look at the, um, that little note by Board of Education funding, um, we don't know what it's going to be this year. Last year we gave them 50, more, 50 million more than the previous year. We know what they asked for, which is 86 million. I thought it was 89. You changed it to 86. Was it 86 or 89? 86. 86. Okay. 86 million over last year. Um, and that obviously takes away everything we have plus more. And so we... Um, we can't really do that the way this all looks. So this is where being county executive is no fun. Uh, go to the next slide. And anticipated pressures on the budget. I mean, these are the things Chris already talked about a little bit. Um, but we know that inflation, people have a pretty good case if you work for Anne Arundel County that you should have a decent raise this year because cost of living is going up, right? That's why that, that number is so high from the school board is they have a pretty good case and they're asking for a 6% cost of living increase plus the step increase and that is very expensive. They're not even asking for that many new positions. Uh, and you'll see in a minute that they, they, they um, are having trouble hiring and retaining staff. Um, but that's true of all of county government and we're gonna hear those, those requests from everywhere. Um, incremental, uh, the revenue the, over last year, the incremental recurring revenue is shrinking because of the recordation tax. Um, the state blueprint for education is actually requiring us to get teacher starting pay up to $60,000 by the year, 20, by FY27. And so even if we didn't want to, we'd have to. I think we do want to pay our teachers better, so, but that's another pressure. Um, and then with inflation, debt service, health insurance costs, um, pension system, all of those things are going up. Um, and then as we try to improve services, our departments come up with great ideas for doing that, and they all seem to cost money. So um, that's the pressure that we're under. Um, this is just a slide um, showing that um, Dr. Bedell has been doing town halls. He's actually showed a slide that's a little out of date that shows us even lower ranked, but this, this shows our teacher starting salary compared to other counties. You saw our taxes are lower than other counties. Well, so are our teacher starting salaries. So um, we are... If you look at the, uh, the counties that, that have the higher salaries, they tend to be the bigger counties that are close to us, and those are unfortunately the ones we're competing with for staff, is our neighbors, um, and those are the larger counties. So um, we, uh, despite having paid the back step increases for teachers and, and done pretty well for them in, in recent budgets, we're still not very competitive with our neighbors. And we are short close to 200 teachers plus 
50 bus drivers plus custodial and and food service workers in our school system, all staff, and uh, they're making the case that in order to be competitive, hire and retain, that they're going to need to pay more. Um, so uh, let's go to the next slide. Here it is. Um, so we have some choices. We can either cut, 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 cut. You know, we can we can always balance a budget with cuts, um, pretty drastic cuts, and minimal, minimally fund, not give much to the Board of Education. That's one option. Another is to do what we really don't like to do, and especially if you work in the budget office or you're Chris Trumbauer, it's, it's sort of um, um, not allowed to use the fund balance um, that we have, and we'll have some extra money left over from the year, but it's one-time money, and use that as though it were recurring. And that's cheating. It creates a thing called a structural deficit, so we wouldn't, we'd prefer not to do that, uh, but it's possible to do it. And then the other is to increase revenue obviously, just like any business, by adjusting tax rates or fees. And the charter says that the way we're supposed to do our budget is look at our needs and then figure out what the tax rate should be to meet those needs. And we're talking real needs. Um, so I actually want to talk about that. I mean, that's the kind of thing that is difficult to talk about because nobody wants to pay more taxes. And we're very proud of having such a low tax rate compared to our neighbors. So we can either do something with the property tax rate um, or we can do something with the income tax rate. Those are the big two, two pots uh, where we can have some real impact. So if you go to the next slide on property tax, uh, we can increase our rate if we choose to. Um, we are at 93.3 cents per hundred, $100 of value. Um, you look at the slide that showed where we were back in the 90s, we were over a dollar in Anne Arundel County. It came down because we have this tax cap um, and because of decisions that, that people made in the past. Um, so if we wanted to start going up on the property tax for every one-tenth of one percent, or every, every cent, I should say, um, so we go from 93 cents to 94 cents, that's $8.7 million. If we went all the way up to a dollar where most of our neighbors are and where we used to be, um, that would be uh, eight times uh, six or seven, six times eight, 48. We could get close to about $50 million in revenue if we did all the way up on that. Uh, I don't want to. You probably don't want to pay it, but it's an option. Income tax, um, similar. The um, um, oh, I should note. I should note that on the property tax, we do have a tax cap that says we can't go up on the property tax um, from where we've projected, unless it's for education. So education funding is not covered by the property tax cap, and so um, we've done that. We did that four years ago. Uh, other counties have done it. The state changed the law to to, to prevent tax caps from. Um, really destroying school systems. And so we can do that if it's for education. Um, income tax, um, every one-tenth of 1% 1 produces $10 million for us that we go up on our income tax. So if we're at 2.8, we go to 2.9, that's $10 million bucks. If we went all the way to 3.2, um, that would be $4 million, uh, $40 million bucks. Um, so a similar kind of an increase. Um, we could do progressive income taxes. That was authorization we got from the state a couple of years ago. Um, federal and state income taxes, you pay a higher rate for higher income, lower rate for, for lower income for the first, first money. So Chris mentioned that last year for the first time, we, did a lo we lowered the rate for your first 50,000 of income, everybody's first 50,000 of income. Um, we could do something to raise revenue by for instance, raising the rate for the higher income folks. If we said for um, taxable income above $250,000, every one-tenth of 1% 1 that they go up produces only $1.4 million. Um, so if we went all the way to 3.2 for people making over a quarter million, um, that would get us another $5 million. So that's just another option that's out there. So as we're talking about things that we want, to pay, that we want in the budget, um, these are the kinds of things that we're going to be considering. So we want your input on those as well. Um, and then before I sit down, we've got, uh, just want to remind you that if you go to aacounty.org slash open Arundel, you can look at performance metrics for all our departments, lots of other information that can help to guide you as you make a case for um, where we should be putting our money. Um, and then the next slide is the, um, it's, they call it the budget buddy. It's, um, it's a place where you can really go in and look at this year's budget in great detail Every, um, every program that we're spending money on. And um, um, if you're a real nerd, you can, you can spend a lot of time there. So I will stop on that and uh, turn it over to Vincent, and we'll get the real show started, which is the listening to you part. And then I, um, 
Uh, Councilwoman Pickard and I, I'm sure, are going to take some notes. At the end, we're not going to respond to everybody's, um, everybody's request one-on-one, -on -one, but at the end, we will say uh, some general things, and we might specifically mention some of your requests. All right, and as the county executive said, now it's time for the public testimony portion of tonight um, where we get to hear from you. This is your chance to let the county leaders know what you would like to see funded in the FY24 budget. Uh, each speaker will get two minutes to give their testimony for the sake of time, just as the county executive mentioned. Um, both he and Councilwoman uh, Picker will not respond to every comment, but they are listening and taking notes and will share their thoughts after we hear from everyone. So please stick around till the end to hear their responses. Um, Colleen Joseph sitting over there will help you keep track of time. She will give you a 30 second warning and let you know when your time has expired. I will uh, start by calling on a list of residents. Uh, please line up behind the microphone uh, in your groups um, and, and that in the order that I call you. Um, and when I call your name, please, yeah, please line up and after we have gotten through the list of people who signed up, we'll open it up for everyone um, if you didn't sign up in advance to speak. Um, and if you don't have time tonight or if you uh, have some thoughts or comments you would like to share after the budget town hall, uh, you can send an email to budget-comments at aecounty.org. Um, I would now call in several of you, so please line up behind the microphone in order to speak. Furthermore, please speak directly into the mic so that everyone can hear you clearly, and please state your name before you begin. So the first group is Paul Cogswell, Pat Riley, and Lovely Bidwell. <laughs> Oops, I'm sorry. I saw this microphone. I thought I was important. No. <laughs> you want to say anything? Sure. Yeah. Go ahead and get up there, and then you get to make the decisions, too. <laughs> None of that is too hard okay. for us. Everybody, whatever you want, we got it. <laughs> have a nice night. Good evening, everybody. My name is Patrick Riley, and I have to serve as the president of the Glenbury Volunteer Fire Company. Um, we had a... I'm sorry? Yeah. Do we like here? I'm not talking loud. I'm sorry about that. Uh, well, again, uh, good evening. My name is Patrick Riley, and I serve as the president of the Glen Burnie Volunteer Fire Company. Uh, we are, are currently facing some challenges, uh, as Ms. Pickard uh, alluded to earlier, you know, in the uncertain eco eco economic times that we're in facing. It's becoming harder and harder for us to raise funds. Um, with that being said, we're also being faced with some challenges, uh, insurance challenges. Uh, we, we have been forced to to go out and find uh, secondary or even primary insurance for things like our, our workman's comp for all the folks that work with us. Uh, currently right now, all of the, the active riding members uh, who actually get on the fire engines to go work there, they are covered under the Anne Arundel County workman's comp. But all of our administrative members, the folks that help do all the fundraising uh, and, and keep everything in order, uh, as well as operate our buildings and, and serve a, uh, as much to the community as any of the firefighters, they're not covered under our workman's comp. Uh, so that's kind of concerning for us because, you know, as a company, if, if we have somebody working with us uh, and they, God forbid, get hurt, you know, then, then we're, we need to cover that. And if they're not covered by the insurance, uh, you know, then, then we're kind of left holding the bag. So we've had to go out and uh, purchase additional insurance or second or, I guess, primary insurance, workman's comp insurance for all of our administrative members. Uh, and that comes as a big cost. I mean, you guys can tell. I guess I'm running out of time. You're waiting to have you already. Uh, at the end of the story is, we're being, we're, it's harder for us to raise money, but we're forced to, to get insurance to cover some of our folks that are helping us to raise money to be able to do things like the million dollar squad that we just put in service this year. Uh, and that's being paid for by the folks that aren't, aren't being covered by the insurance. Um, again, uh, we appreciate your time and thanks for listening to us. Thank you, Patrick. Paul Cogswell, treasurer of Glen Burnie Volunteer Fire Company. Um, we've been in service for 100 years, and we've never had any problems, but we are at a standstill, as you know, the county knows that you know, money's tight, and we need some help with uh, the, what do you call it, workman's comp insurance right now, because our people that, people that help us to raise the money to put this stuff on the street are not covered at this time. At one time, I believe they were. 
because at one time they had to get a badge number in order to be covered by the county, but I don't think it stands true anymore. So again, and, and just not workman's comp, there's other insurances too we're looking at, just to keep us covered. Like Patrick said, a million dollar squad, somebody has the major boo-boo, then we're in trouble, you know, because the county picks up what they feel it's worth, and we're responsible for the rest of it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Laura Lee Bidwell, and I am the Staff Association Chair of the Anne Arundel County Public Library and a librarian at the Glen Burnie Branch. I've been a library employee for over six years now, and I've collected many stories. I've worked with some of the most caring, genuine, and creative people you could ever hope to meet. We are educators. We are social workers. We provide a listening ear. We are entertainers and hosts to expert guests. We are the best search engines. We are librarians. In today's technology and profit-driven profit -driven world, libraries are the one haven where there is no expectation to spend money and people can still connect with the world around them. We are community centers and cultural hubs where people experience opportunities they never would without us. Libraries are for absolutely everyone where prejudice meets reckoning and we strive to coexist amicably. We offer services not readily found elsewhere need help building a resume and finding a job, need help finding food and shelter, are you homebound and want to keep up with your favorite authors and books, do you need help with homework or genealogy research, are you a small business owner who doesn't have a workspace just yet, do you need tax forms, would you like to learn your way around a computer or a tablet, do you need legal advice but you can't afford a lawyer, I can go on and on. The scope and quantity of needs that our talented, kind, versatile staff members meet every day is beyond amazing, but I think this quote from a library by mail customer says it all. Thank you so very much for the concern, understanding, hope, and love that ACPL gave me each day. You made each day livable for the next. And yet, we have staff who rely on our food pantries to get by and have had to get roommates to help pay rent. Many are one car repair away from financial disaster. So please, value libraries, love libraries, and please also trust this excellent library to ask for what it needs to keep delivering excellent value. Prioritize our request for overdue market rate compensation adjustments in recognition of the wonderful staff we want to keep, attract, and employ on behalf of our whole county. Thank you. Thank you, Laura Lee. Up next, we have David Grempler, Joseph Adavanoa, and Demita McDonald. My name's uh, David Grempler. There is $109 million budgeted for roads and bridges, 50,000 of which is for transit riders, which is roughly the average price of a new car. There's simply no viable alternative other than owning a vehicle here. The county's investing 99.95% of its roads and bridges budget into projects that prioritize vehicle ownership. It gets worse. $1 million to store more road salt. Two parking garages get $4.5 million the 1,350-ish parking spots. Recreation and parking shows 15 of 52 projects increasing parking capacity and zero of 52 projects increasing bus stops. I could go on, but I have to read, have you tried reading one of those budgets? They're boring. I can tell you not a single person is here because of the beauty of our parking garages. They don't marvel at the quantity of our parking spaces and they definitely don't come because of our traffic. The county must invest in alternate modes of transportation. Painting a line on the road and calling a bike lane is not acceptable. Go ride your bike on the new lane on Benfield Road. Do you feel safe? Bike lanes must be dedicated to bikes. They must not share the road with cars and trucks. People will not use infrastructure they do not feel safe using. This means more sidewalks, more bike lanes, more buses, with more bus routes that come more frequently, with more stops that get more people from where they live to where they work, shop, and play. The benefits of reducing the number of vehicles on our roads cannot be overstated, so buckle up. 
All right, the science is out there and it isn't on the sides of more road, of more cars and trucks. For you, for me, and for everyone who is and will be a resident of Anne Arundel County, the building of more personal vehicle infrastructure is unsustainable. We need to start seriously investing in viable alternatives. Thank you. Thank you, David. Hello, uh, Joe Devanola, President, Professional Firefighters in Arundel County, Local 1563. Thank you, Councilman Woman Pickett and County Exec Pittman for letting us speak today at the, con the uh, Budget Town Halls. Uh, with the continued growth of the county population, I want to stress the ongoing importance of resourcing and staffing for the fire department. Um, I know uh, everybody's read about the long hospital wait times and the shortage of nurses at hospitals. That puts an absolute stress on the fire department resources. It affects our ability to stay in service. Our paramedics are staying at those hospitals for hours upon time and out of service and cannot respond to the next emergency. So it puts a, a, an unbelievable stress on our paramedics that are waiting at the hospital. Uh, I know over the years, the county executive raised the numbers of uh, firefighters and paramedics in the county. I want them to continue to do so. Uh, right now, our staffing levels are a, a bit below the uh, national standards. And uh, I, I hope that we can continue to put money in the budget to add new firefighters and paramedics. Uh, we're pretty much running 99.5% uh, of the calls in the county. And I want to thank my fellow uh, man for uh, buying that squad because most of the time we're going to be running that squad. Professional firefighters. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Good evening. I'm Demita McDonald, a member of the Library Board of Trustees and a resident of District 2. I want to thank Councilwoman Pickard and County Executive Pittman for your tremendous support of the libraries. I joined the Library Board of Trustees because libraries are community resources that provide opportunities for learning, connection, creative expression uh, to people of all ages and stages of life. I urge your support for the top priority for the Library Board of Trustees and our CEO, ensuring staff are compensated fairly and competitively. Our library staff are exceptional, and during the pandemic, they went above and beyond. Every day, library staff are helping people live better lives. For example, one recent customer needed help re with recertification for a housing voucher. She worried she'd lose her voucher and apartment because she couldn't get the documents submitted. Library staff help her create an email address and upload her documents in time. Another patron who uses our homebound mail service said, quote, your books keep me alive, really. It helps me to stay alert and awake. Every day, library staff are strengthening our communities but are paid on average 12% less than their colleagues in other systems. More than half aren't compensated at the market rate. Many have decades of service, but have maxed out on what they can be paid and must leave the system for increased pay. I'm asking for your support of our supplemental budget request of $2.9 million in salary adjustments for 171 staff to ensure we maintain a high level of service and can attract the best staff, we must pay library staff what they deserve. Thank you for your support of this request. Thank you, Demita. Um, and before we continue, I'd like to recognize all the way from South County, Maria Matteo with the Democratic Central Committee. If you could wave your hand. And Aaron Carperwitz with ACDS. Up next to the mic, uh, Lisa Ingram, Chris Weinstein, and Michael Shear. Hello, my name is Lisa Ingram. I've been a volunteer at Anne Arundel County Animal Care and Control for over 11 years now. I'm also a member of the county's Animal Welfare Council and a District 2 resident. We volunteers contributed 15,227 hours of free labor to the shelter last year. 
Not to sound immodest, but thank goodness we're there to help because the county's tiny paid staff is stretched to the breaking point. In fact, I believe the problem's more serious today than any other time in the 11 years since I have volunteered. It's a combination of not enough budgeted staff positions, drawn out processes for filling vacancies that leave current positions empty for many months and the difficult, relatively low paying jobs. Right now, for example, seven of the 32 full-time positions are vacant. Here's just one example of how stretched the existing staff is. Animal care and control officers are the ones who respond to citizens' urgent requests for help with dangerous animals, with pets who are being abused, with lost and found animals, and with injured strays. They are our county's 911 for animals. But often citizens are frustrated by how long it takes for an officer to arrive. That's because there are so few officers now that only one is on duty to respond to citizen requests for help throughout our 588 square mile county. On a recent day, picked at random, for example, the single available officer spent at least three hours and 14 minutes of her eight hour shift driving at least 119 miles going first from the Millersville shelter to Annapolis, then to Gambrels, then to West River, then Glen Burnie, back to Annapolis, over to Davidsonville, and finally to Pasadena. And this doesn't count trips back to the shelter with animals she'd picked up. Please grant Animal Care and Control's requests for additional staff, including more officers. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Hello, my name is Chris Weinstein. I'm the president of Friends of Anne Arundel County Animal Care and Control, and I have been a shelter volunteer for nine years. The uh, thank you, we really do thank you and appreciate what you've done in previous budgets for us. But animal control was neglected for decades, and it's going to take some more work to get it up to where it really needs to be. Uh, the biggest ask of all is a new shelter. You both have toured our shelter, our 23-year-old poorly constructed shelter. Its haphazard, outdated layout fails to meet animal shelter guidelines. Cats, for example, live in a room that's right next to a room full of barking dogs. Newly arrived dogs stand next to cats who are cowering in wire cages stacked on top of each other on the ground. Its heating and cooling system is unreliable despite many expensive temporary fixes. In addition, the shelter's grounds are about to shrink. The shelter is not expanding, it is actually shrinking. The police department is building a 55,000 square foot single story complex on an open field between the shelter and the fire headquarters with a parking lot and stormwater mitigation system that's going to wrap behind the shelter. It will eliminate the shelter's current farmyard and the outdoor play pens where dogs now meet potential adopters and where they get brief breaks from living in cages. Almost all the open spaces where volunteers now safely walk dogs will disappear. Despite the negative impact on its ability to provide safe, human, humane care for its dogs, animal care and control was not included in the planning of this new building. In recent years, Baltimore City and Montgomery, St. Mary's, Calvert, and Baltimore counties have built new animal shelters that expand their resources and improve what they can do for homeless pets. We hope Anne Arundel County will too. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Good evening. I'm Mike Shire with the Anne Arundel County Fraternal Order of Police, representing the active and retired police officers of Anne Arundel County. First, I want to thank you, County Executive Pittman and Councilwoman Pickard, for the opportunity to speak here tonight. I also want to thank you both for your support of the police department and its officers. We need that support now as much as ever. In our county, our police officers provide service to our communities with the highest level of professionalism. We've earned the highest level of accreditation, and anyone who's watching knows that we serve with bravery and dedication. That has produced measurable results, while our surrounding jurisdictions like Prince George's County and Baltimore City have seen skyrocketing crime rates. We haven't seen that in Anne Arundel County. But as you know, because of staffing def deficits, a single police officer in Anne Arundel County shoulders a load of up to 50% higher than those neighboring <laughs> jurisdictions. 
You showed a graph of our teachers and their salaries, Mr. County Executive, and showing how low they are compared to neighboring jurisdictions. We can show you a similar graph for our Anne Arundel County police officers. An independent study that was completed seven years ago told us that our agency was woefully understaffed. Since then, we've added other positions that weren't even considered by this study, mostly focused on community policing. The previous administration that came before you buried that report. It's time to dig it up and dust it off. It's time for our county government to take strong and decisive action to properly staff our agency. We cannot continue to deliver the level of service that our citizens expect and deserve with our current staffing. The tasks and responsibilities continue to pile up on us, and it just becomes untenable. Uh, despite some gains in staffing early in your first administration, we've seen those staffing levels stagnate. Just for comparison, Montgomery County has over 1,300 officers, Prince George's County nearly 1,800 officers, Baltimore County nearly 2,000 officers, Anne Arundel County is staffed at 784 officers. Folks, we aren't even in the ballpark. We don't have half the population of these other jurisdictions, but we have less than half as many police officers. We're asking for you to follow through on your commitments to our county's public safety and help increase our staffing and our competitiveness with these other jurisdictions so we can keep this county safe. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Up next, we have Jay Soul, Bob Brash, and Earl Smith. Good evening, uh, County Executive Pittman and Councilwoman Picard. I am here from the Seven Crest Homeowners Association, which Allison has come to visit us sometimes. Our concern uh, is not so much a budget issue, but it is part of the budget issue, is the uh, intersection at Route 170 and Minnetonka Road, which we uh, use daily for our Seven Crest homeowners. In addition to Seven Crest, though, there's uh, 19 single family homes that were <coughs> built at Seven Reserve, which joins uh, Minnetonka at Truett Lane. Uh, Seven Meadows, 116 townhomes, enter 170, one eighth mile north of Minnetonka Road. Seven Crossroads, 45 townhomes and three retail sites under construction, enter 170, one quarter mile south of Route 170 of Minnetonka. In addition, there's 300 townhouses under construction to enter 170 at Riker Road, three-eighths of a mile north of Minnetonka Road, and uh, will further increase the traffic there. Now, they have the benefit up there of Riker Road because the uh, highway is four lanes. And as you know, 170 is under <coughs> development for uh, expansion and hopefully will be four lanes all the way down, will be four lanes down to 174. Okay, um, but the point being is that we may not get the same privilege where they can cross the road to a center section safely. So we have been, for since 2016, asking for a traffic light at 170 and Minnetonka Road. Now there's one other development called the Seven Village at 70 Crest, which is intersects our development as well, 46 townhomes and 20 bed assisted living facility. They've been since 2016 trying to get their uh, application approved and I think planning and zoning is finally getting frustrated with them. So the point being is that you might get more revenue from Seven Crest, I mean, excuse me, the village is Seven Crest, but you're already getting a lot of revenue from all these other developments and yet we have a safety issue because we don't have a traffic light. So we were requesting support to get that traffic light. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Bob Barash, and I'm going to. I'm from Severn Crest as well, and I thank uh, Executive Pittman and Councilwoman Picard for allowing us to be here tonight. Uh, I'm going to follow up on Jay's remarks uh, with the, the widening of uh, 170 from near Wiker, and it looks like it goes almost to the uh, the fire station just a little bit beyond 170, 174. So it's going to take it from a two-lane road to, it looks like a four-lane road, 
And where we are now, it is uh, extremely difficult to get out, I would say at peak hours in the morning and in the evening, but it's getting to be more and more so on a regular basis, full time. Uh, the villas that, that Jay mentioned are coming in and they've been trying to get into the com our community and build the 45 townhomes and an assisted living in our area. And uh, we've done two requests with the state to study and to try to get a light or a self-actuating light or at least a turning lane there, all of which have been refused. And it looks like with the widening now of 170 coming in, that has not been addressed at all. Uh, we've talked with several other uh, state highway folks and they, they've never indicated that there's going to be anything put in there other than the widening to the four lanes. Uh, Jay also mentioned, if, if you're familiar with our area, and he's mentioned some of the properties, but in the last, I would say four or five years, there's probably been 10 developments coming in there and are in construction, under construction, 300 units, 150 units, uh, 45 units, all within a mile or less of the 170, 174 intersection. If you go out a little bit further, and, and the traffic has increased and increased. I can go back to BRAC, that brought in 50 to 60,000 people to Fort Meade every day. With the cyber uh, command that's gone in, that's an additional 10,000. We don't get all that traffic, but we certainly get a, lo a lot of it. And we're not the only community that's affected by the traffic on 170. There's not a safe way to get out. If we want to get out, we have to turn right and go down and, and, and Jerry would get around. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. My name is Earl Smith, and I'm speaking on behalf of uh, substitute teachers. Um, I'm a permanent substitute here at Glen Burnie High School. Uh, been here going on six years. Prior to that, I was at uh, the former George Fox Middle School. Uh, and I'm speaking on behalf of not only uh, myself as permanent sub, but uh, daily subs, our long-term subs, other staff, like you mentioned, uh, bus drivers, uh, staff that serves our students meals, um, additional income, particularly in these inflationary times, definitely welcome and helpful. Um, don't know how much your offices can affect, I think, the crux of the problem, um, though I need to mention it, I think it's really the environment in the school, the toxic environment in the classrooms, probably on the buses, in the lunchrooms, uh, student behavior, profanity, um, disrespect. So whatever can be done uh, to rectify that situation would go a long way to solving perhaps uh, some of the budgetary problems because I think a lot of teachers, if they had a real choice between extra money and a healthier environment, they would choose a healthier environment. And uh, we just don't have the numbers unless the students are on board and, and we have an effective means to, to uh, handle uh, issues, problem issues then they always will have superior numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Earl. <coughs> Up next, we have Deanna Edmonds and Stephen Waddy. Hi there, uh, I am Deanna Edmonds. I am a second grade teacher at Glendale Elementary. <coughs> Thank you to Councilwoman Pickard and um, Mr. Pittman, or County Executive Pittman, for all of your support with education. It really has been, we, we've needed it. Um, now, I have to say, I've actually, as a teacher, been having a great year this year, and that has come from the fact that our school is a Title I school, so we do get extra funding, and our school has chosen to use that funding to fund personnel. Now, I know that a big problem amongst other schools is that they don't have the staffing that they need. For us, we have enough that we can have some permanent substitute teachers who are able to be there reliably. We don't have any missing staff at all in our building, and that has made such a huge difference for us. Also, with the addition of the Title I money, there are intervention support teachers who are able to push in and help us, and I don't know that I would be half as effective as a teacher this year if I didn't have the support 
of my reading intervention teacher who pushes in for a half an hour and uh, the cyst who pushes in for the full math hour with me. It is only because of them that I feel like I'm able to get even close to closing those academic gaps that we know are a result of the COVID-19 year. Um, we really are seeing the effects still with this year in second grade and I'm doing the best. Teaching was already hard, but trying to also close those gaps, it's, I, even with that support, I'm still working to too many hours and that's coming from a situation that is good right now. So just please fund teachers so that it can be competitive enough that we can get more staff into our buildings. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deanna. Hello, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Stephen Whitey, I'm the first vice president for the Anne Arundel County NAACP. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm the first vice president for the Anne Arundel County NAACP. And we do have some budget priorities, um, increased funding for the following agencies. One, the Police Accountability Board, the best practices from the National Association of Civilian Oversight and Law Enforcement state that the budget for an oversight agency should be at least 1% of the budget and uh, of the agency that it is overseeing. Uh, the current budget is at around seven hundred and some thousand dollars We ask that it be increased around $3.5 million because the Police Accountability Board is overseeing five different agencies. Um, Human Relations Commission. This organization is tasked with implementing the Fair Housing Law. For the past three years, the cost of renting and purchasing a home in Anne Arundel County has risen at a rate not seen for decades. There have been several demand side initiatives, largely funded by the federal government to support buyers and renters in meeting the prices that are being forced upon them by landlords, real estate agents, developers, and other supply side actors. The Human Relations Commission is a key lever for the local government to use in taming supply side behaviors that have snatched the incomes of already reeling consumers with even greater inflationary tactics. Uh, according to the Consumer Price Index, housing, healthcare, education, including early child care and transportation, are the largest expenses for individual consumers. The Human Relations Commission must have an additional $5 million in funding to hire investigators, attorneys, and data analysts that contain the price gouging that is destroying the will of local renters and taking all of their first time home buyer funds, down payment funds, and home buyers uh, will, that will likely, it's gonna force a decline in population for the county. Um, we also have corrections and transportation as well. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And now we will uh, open the floor to anyone who has not spoken yet. If you would like to state your budget priorities, please line up behind the mic. Hello. Thank you for transparency and how you develop the budget. You know, it is very important for people to know where their taxpayer is going and making sure that you are, in fact, spending money uh, on things that are important to the taxpayer. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'm Maria Matiella, and uh, my passion is making sure that there's equity in education because there won't be equity in society unless there's equity in education. Dr. Fidel, who's a superintendent of the uh, Anne Arundel School District, has made it very clear that there is a learning gap, a, a growing learning gap in uh, kids whose primary language is not English. You know? So these are kids that need a little bit more attention. So my suggestion, I've been a sixth grade teacher, I've taught uh, college classes, and I know for a fact that individualized teaching, individualized learning, tutoring, makes all the difference for kids that need to, or adults that need to catch up in their learning. And so I hope that you are able to fund tutors for these kids, tutors after school or tutors before school, tutors on weekends, holidays, whenever, but kids who are, who are falling behind, and they are, the superintendent has said so, there are statistics that show it, they are falling behind. We will not have equity in this society or in our education system until we start 
paying attention to kids who fall behind because of structural issues like overcrowded classrooms. We need to have to, uh, tutors for these kids. Please fund this requirement. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Good evening. My name is Dan Friend. I'm a resident of District 2 and an assistant coach with a youth softball team based out of Severn Danza Park, where my youngest child also plays. I come before you today to advocate for Anne Arundel County to commit resources to provide and to consider requiring public access AEDs at county parks and recreational facilities. Most of you are probably aware of the events surrounding the NFL's recent on-field sudden cardiac arrest. While injury-related cardiac events are rare, research indicates they are most common in our young athletes, especially those playing baseball, softball, and football. According to the American Academy of Pediatric Statistics, 39% of sudden cardiac arrests in children are sports-related. In addition to our parks hosting these young athletes most at risk, the same parks also host visitors of all ages yearly. Data shows that over 350,000 out-of-hospital sudden cardiac arrests occur in the United States annually, with over 90% of them being fatal. This low survival rate dramatically increases when layperson responders apply an AED early, in addition to CPR prior to EMS arrival. According to the American Heart Association, early CPR and defibrillation within three to five minutes can increase survival rates as high as 75%. Anne Arundel County has adopted PulsePoint, an app that directs layperson responders to provide CPR to nearby victims and the closest public access AED. Research shows that this app helps double survival rates in communities where it's applied. Unfortunately, the same app shows that Anne Arundel County lacks publicly accessible AEDs in the case of many of our parks. While there are 21 parks that have AEDs in Anne Arundel, Paul's point shows that most, if not all, are stored in offices with limited hours, making them inaccessible to the public much of the time. Using the public Using the Pulse Point app and Severn Danza as an example, there's not one within five miles of publicly accessible. The 2023 budget includes many necessary investments in our parks, but none that would have such a profound impact on the safety and survival of our children, citizens, and visitors as funding public access AED stations in our most frequented public areas. I ask you to consider this as you make decisions regarding the budget, and thank you all for your time. Thank you, Dan. Hello, Stephen White again. Just wanted to follow up uh, in regards to corrections. Uh, according to the local organization Freedom Fighters, there are no local transitional housing facilities for state inmates who are current or returning to the county following their parole or completion of their sentence. This lack of housing forces returning citizens to claim a, a drug addiction that they may not have in order to stay in a local drug treatment facility. In addition, it creates a cycle of recidivism, which is disproportionately high in Anne Arundel County. The NAACP urges the county to allocate 2% of the detention center budget to providing publicly owned uh, transitional housing for returning citizens. Um, and there were around 5,000 mental health uh, reviews and, and uh, incidents according to the detention center budget. And we would like to see increased funding for mental health services uh, for uh, individuals who are in the detention center um, or even subject to possible policing, you know, to go along with the mental health uh, priorities and focuses of this administration. Um, free school lunch. Students across the county are experiencing the humiliation, often at the hands of their own parents, of not being able to afford school lunches. Parents question why students would force debt upon them by eating a school lunch when they have food at home. Students are forced to explain the lack of food at home to their friends, teachers, and even absent parents. Many of us are receiving text messages and phone calls every day from the school system regarding the lack of uh, a child that has not paid for school lunch. Um, rising food prices have hit families in the pocket and the lack of free school lunch for families of four making 200% over, the, over the poverty rate should be remedied through this budget. Thank you. Thank you, Stina. Hello. Um, thank you for having these uh, budget town halls again this year. It's nice to be back in person. Um, I wasn't planning to come up here tonight, but um, something kind of has happened recently that I think you guys need to be aware of. Um, I am Jennifer Stivers. I've been a volunteer with Animal Care and Control for about six years. Um, over that time, I've seen a lot of really great improvements. Unfortunately, right now, staffing is a huge issue. And as a federal investigator myself, I understand 
background investigations and I know they take time and it has a lot of moving parts, um, but I really urge you to try and expedite some of our hiring. Um, we have some positions that have been fit not filled for many months um, and this Saturday our last um, can, uh, sorry, technician, um, we have supposed to have three, um, she's leaving so there will be zero. Um, so as a result, people like the supervisors are going to be checking in animals and people, if they need to give up their animal, sometimes they don't have time to wait. Um, so with this struggle um, of staffing, people are either going to resort to dumping their animals or um, saying they found them as a stray to try to get them in the door sooner. Um, and I think this is just gonna have a really negative impact. Um, and uh, also uh, without these technicians, um, we're hoping to start surgery soon with our new vet that you helped us get. Um, and that's really exciting, but our position that you also helped us get our uh, volunteer rescue foster coordinator, she's been asked to help assist with these surgeries in addition to her other three jobs. <laughs> um, and these people, they really try to do as much as they can, but they're really getting burnt out. And I think that getting some replacements in the door will really help. Thank you, Jennifer. Good evening. Thank you, Councilwoman Pickard and County Executive Pittman for having these uh, town halls again. Um, my name is Donald Kelly. I'm a resident of Severn. I have used Severn Danza Park. Uh, I'd like to make a comment. I don't usually do public speaking, but I'd like to make a comment on uh, Mr. Friend's request. Uh, I worked in the county and about three years ago, I had a cardiac arrest. Um, the person I was working with started CPR, used an AED that was accessible right away, and three years later, I'm still walking. So I would like to see public access to fibrillators uh, placed in the parks. I know there's a law, Connor's law, that requires them to be at swimming pools because of previous incidents that have happened. So I would just like to see some, a little more effort put into that. And thank you, Mr. Friend, for bringing that up. Thank you, Donna. Hello, County Executive Pittman, Councilwoman Pickard, Budget Officer Trumbauer, um, Mr. Molden, and residents of Anne Arundel County. My name is Skip Ald. I'm Chief Executive Officer of Anne Arundel County Public Library. The Glen Burnie Library opened in 1969 and will be replaced over the next few years with a brand new 32,000 square foot library at the same location. In addition, this library will have 8,000 square feet devoted to the archaeology and cultural resources of our county. We'll begin design of the new library in July, and we expect it to open five years from now. To our audience, if you have a library card, would you raise your hand? I think a lot of people have cards. About more than half of the people in Anne Arundel County have cards, and about 150,000 use the libraries every year. And here are a couple of things that your neighbors have said about the value of libraries. First. This, these are quotes. When I was a kid, I owed $65, so I didn't go to the library for years until now that there are no fines. Second, I had fun using the fishing rod at the Deal Pier. I caught two croakers. And finally, I just got my library card last week, and I already took the LinkedIn class. You saved me $35. I mentioned these things because our staff are our most valuable resource. Unfortunately, our staff are severely underpaid relative to their peers in neighboring counties. Our payroll is about 12% below the market average for similar library systems. Our number one budget priority is to bring our staff up to comparable salaries with their peers. We do have other priorities, including an equity officer and other positions, continued development of our kindergarten readiness program, and more money for books, music, and movies. Thank you for consideration of all of our requests. Thank you, Skip. Last call. Anyone want to tell us your budget priorities? All right. I would like to thank everyone for the great dialogue tonight. All right. We have one more. Good evening, everyone.
everyone. My name was just given. My name is Laura Ellis, and I'm on the HOA board for Severn Crest, but I am speaking as an individual. We have been working with the county concerning the road on 170 and Manitoka. I'm sorry, I can't pronounce that correctly, but the traffic there for those who have left there is very difficult, and I understand that there's been studies done that reveal that we don't need a light, but for a person who lives there, the senior um, community, and we have another community where we have young people, and so we're very concerned. We've asked and asked and asked, and someone has come out, um, and they want to redo the road and make it more lanes. So it's going to go from two lanes to four lanes. I'm, that's just too many lanes to cross, and it's dangerous. Secondly, uh, we're a 55 plus community and we've already been extended. And now there's another proposal for another development to come right through our community um, with number of houses and apartments that would totally change our community. And you know, it's bad enough that it's already being extended that's not 55 plus. And just as there are facilities and everything for younger people, we wanna make sure there are uh, safe places for older people to live as well and to live safely. And finally, I don't know if anybody talked about the new pool. I was at the last meeting. I agreed with the community. The place where you're proposing the pool facility is not appropriate. So hopefully we will find an appropriate place because I love to swim. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Okay. I would now like to thank everyone for the wonderful dialogue tonight. Um, and again, if you have any comments that you would like to share, please send them to budget-comments at aecounty.org. Um, now we'll turn it over to our elected officials for closing remarks, and we will begin with Councilwoman Pickard. Well, again, I wanna thank everybody for coming out tonight. Um, it's really important not only to do uh, to have the budget tools that are here and to have this dialogue, but for each of you to hear your fellow neighbors' concerns. I know there was a very clear running theme tonight about staffing levels in the county and wages, and I think it is going to be a main issue for for this county budget. I don't get to propose the budget, but um, uh, I will uh, be advocating to make sure. Uh, we have competitive wages. I think it is one of the biggest issues facing our county so that we can have the staff that we need to provide the services uh, to make this the best county for all, best place for all. But we also have, we know, and I know the county executive knows that we also have to work on our hiring practices. That's not necessarily a budget issue, that's a procedural issue to make sure when uh, folks are ready to gain employment with the county that it doesn't take that long. So I know it's a priority of the county executive. Again, that's an executive function. But um, I do want, I've heard everybody, I've written a lot of notes. Uh, nothing I, uh, nothing uh, that was said tonight was things I haven't heard before. So I wanna thank everybody for coming out and I'll let the um, county executive have the last word. So thank you. Uh, that was a lot of stuff and a lot of good stuff. And I, I um, as I'm sitting here listening, it, you know, this is the first one this year, and I do love these, <clears throat> and they do work because um, when you sit down and you have to make the decisions at the table, once we've heard from all of our departments, which is another part of this process, um, I do think back on what we hear at these town halls, and, and what you say probably hits me a little harder than anything else that I hear. Um, not that the department head's messages aren't important, but, but hearing from you all, um, I mean, you know, hearing from somebody who saved their life, who, whose life was saved, who would not be here had there not been that defibrillator there. Um, we won't forget that. <laughs> I can't forget that, so thank you for sharing. Um, so a f just a few things. Um, I had heard a little bit about the, the um, workers' comp insurance issue with the volunteer firefighters. Um, would be good to have some numbers on, on what, what you're paying and what it's costing and, and seeing. Um, I'm not making promises about doing it, but there you are know, policy issues there. But um, 
we want to look at that. Um, <clears throat> the um, I was glad that somebody brought up the, the need for more multimodal transportation. This county was built for cars. I, I got the opportunity to ride in a, uh, a police helicopter in the first year, and you know, going down the Route 3 corridor um, was, was amazing just how much of the land was parking lots and, and road and um, sprawl, basically, sprawl development. So I'm, I'm, we do have a great transportation office and a multimodal transportation plan, and uh, um, we're serious about it. We're doing the, the Pearl Transit Center where um, we'll be the central place for a lot of the buses, um, which is a, a $15 million project that's in our budget. And we have the South Shore Trail and the WBNA Trail and, and the spurs connecting it all. We're hoping that within, I was hoping by the end of my second term that it would all be connected. We'll see, we'll be close anyway. Um, and we need to do things to encourage people um, actually, I heard Gavin Buckley this morning, the mayor of Annapolis, talking to the Economic Development Association of the state, um, and he was trying to make Annapolis um, completely um, um, run off of green energy and, and transportation. And he said that the reason that people don't ride bikes in this town the way they do in Europe is because we don't want to die. It is too dangerous. So we need to make it safe. Um, and that was a good point. I want to thank our, our professional firefighters uh, for being here, as well as our police officers for being here and making the case. Um, we need to hear it over and over again. You all need to hear them present um, the, the, um, the needs that we have. And we are still building this county um, back from a time when the neglect was extraordinary in, in, um, in public safety in terms of staffing levels and pay. And we want to continue building back. Um, you know, our library systems, I'm, I'm glad so many people testified from the libraries. You know, we don't have many community centers in this county, and the libraries are gathering places. The libraries provide so much more than just books that we that we think of libraries as being there for. Um, the community services we have, I mean, we didn't even hear half of it. And um, so I, I am aware that library staff are um, underpaid, and uh, that is something I know you did a, um, a study on that. And we're going to be looking hard at that as well. Um, animal care and control. Thank you for, <laughs> thank you for being here in your green shirts. Um, keep those shirts. I'm sure you'll need them every year. Um, but um, did I say what color is that? <laughs> They're purple. Did I say green? Yeah. Green's my favorite color. It just comes out of my mouth. Purple. I am not colorblind. <laughs> right. um, but. You know, I was particularly concerned. I mean, clearly we need staff. I was particularly concerned when I heard that all three technician positions are unstaffed right now. And so, um, and I know we have had that in other departments as well, the, the, the slow pace of hiring the personnel system. We're going to be doing personnel reform. A lot of our department heads have said the same, that we need, to, we need to move faster in this economy when we're hiring or we lose people. And that's probably why you have that crisis going on. Um, and um, so we'll be looking at that. Um, and Severn Crest um, Homeowners Association, I, um, you know more about this than I do. She was passing me notes. I know that SHA is, is uh, they are doing four lanes, and they are talking about a turn signal, but they're saying that there's not a need at this point for a, a stop light, but they will look at that again, and um, we will encourage them. Obviously, it's a state road, um, but we want to hear from you, and then we go and we talk to them. So we'll talk more about that. Um, I was really thrilled to hear the story about your school that is fully staffed <laughs> because that tells the story about why our schools need to be fully staffed and that you're having a good year. Um, so I will remember that and share that as we talk about the need to, um, to, to hire and retain the staff that we need. Um, and, um, and I was glad to hear something about housing as well. Uh, there's an article that's going to be in the Capitol tomorrow about um, uh, so, you know, people in our reentry programs can't find housing. People in, uh, who, who are going through other services in the county, um, you know, women who have been um, um, the victims of domestic violence um, have come into shelters and places and gotten services, but those shelters are saying that there isn't enough transitional housing and there is not enough affordable housing. We have a crisis um, in this county. Um, Councilwoman Pickard and I um, share that view, and we have to... Um, we have to do more in terms of funding and we have to do more in terms of zoning to allow different kinds of housing throughout our county so that um, we can build more affordable housing for our residents. Um, 
And um, I'll stop there. It's a lot of stuff. Thank you all for being here. And um, thank you for engaging and, and stay engaged. It ain't over. Um, the, our budget requests will go to the council, and then you can go to their budget hearings, um, their school board budget, budget hearings as well. Um, and we really do um, want to hear from you. And we'll do as much as we can. Thanks.